Army Air Force, and I spent uh, 21, 22 years with them, off and on. Went from open cockpit flying to jets. I learned to fly jets before I retired. And uh, during one of our trips up from Cuba, Chiba, we were hunting submarines, uh, came to Orwell and buzzed it real good, uh, September 22, 1943. Bent the old maple trees right over flat on the top. And lots of people are, were young then, but they remembered it and they gave me a nice plaque today. <coughs> now, uh, as far as World War II, I've got that written. And I'll send you a copy of that. And you can, you know, do it, pick out parts of it. It, it tells every mission mm -hmm. where we went. I've got it all listed. And there's a book out about the 464th bomb group. Frank Holly, who lived over here in Windsor, he and my wife graduated from Orwell High School in 1940. And Frank ended up being a tail gunner in a squadron next to the one that I was in over in Italy. And I didn't know anything about it until I got a letter from Edith saying, Frank Holly, look him up. So I looked him up. And in the meantime, I had a brand new crew. Oh, I had a brand new crew when I got there, and I had an airplane, and, it was, and I named it the Pride of Orwell. The Pride of Orwell was a B-24G model. We flew up three missions, and on the 6th of June, 1944, I didn't go on the mission. And the pilot that took my crew, they went to Ploesky and they got shot down. And the only person killed was the pilot. They all bailed out safe over Sofia, Bulgaria. And they, they shot Bert Hayes to death on, on his way in the parachute. All the rest of the guys got out. But anyway, back to Frank Holly. After that happened, I, uh, was, my job was to fly new crews. I came over from the States, and I needed a, a good tail gunner, and Frank Holly from Windsor was a good one. And I met him. I went to see him. I'd heard that he was there, and I asked him if he wanted to fly with, with me. And he says, yeah, that'd be good. So lo and behold, we were in the process of getting him transferred so he could help me fly new crews. He got shot down over Blackheimer. The airplane blew up, and I, wa I saw it, and I counted six shoots, and I thought, knowing Frank Holly, he'd be one of them. But it never happened. And I came back and saw his uh, mother and father and told them that I thought he made it. Turned out he didn't. But anyway, this book, uh, I've had it about a year, and it tells the whole history of uh, the 464th Bomb Group, including Frank Holly, and he's in the book, and I'm in the book, and uh, it's very interesting. Hist hist history of, you know, two guys from Orwell, Ohio, meeting in Italy. And then another classmate of mine, Dick Cook, I met him in, in, in Naples. I found out he was over there. So well, here's a, a guy from Windsor, a guy from Orwell, and a guy from Colbrook in Italy in World War II meet. <laughs> That's unheard of, you know, the odds on that are terrific. But I've got all that written down and I'll send you a copy. Okay. And you can use what you like. Now, you were telling me earlier you were in Cuba. and yeah. how, And how did that lead to you for the tape of, uh, of Buzz and Orwell? And, yeah. and, how, and how did you do it again? <clears throat> See, we, we were uh, stationed right out of Havana, Cuba, and from August to September, October of 43, chasing a sub, hunting submarine between the coast of Cuba and the coast of Yucatan. We kept 24-hour patrol on that. And from the coast of Cuba to, to the coast of Florida, Key West, we had a 24-hour patrol trying to keep the submarines out of the Gulf because they, they were sinking ships in the Gulf and all up and down the East Coast. German subs were just raising game. So our job was to try to keep them out of there. We, ne we hunted many, many hours of patrols, but never uh, ever got one. And that was that during that time that uh, on the weekends, our boss said, you can go anywhere within a thousand miles for, for training, navigational training and everything. So that's when I decided to, this friend of mine had a, uh, girlfriend in uh, Indianapolis, and he said, Bob, I'm going up there. Uh, do you, would you like to go? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. If I can have the airplane from Indianapolis to go to Youngstown. 
He said, well, you know, we aren't supposed to do that. I, yeah, but he said, okay, he's crazy. <laughs> so I borrowed the airplane and didn't have any 100 octane fuel and down in uh, Youngstown, so we thought we had enough to get to Cleveland. But we didn't. And I was buzzing all over real good. Uh, two engines on the same side quit. Flew it to Air uh, Hopkins Airport, landed it, didn't hit the runway, landed north of it. In the grass, didn't hurt a thing, knock on wood. Took on 2,700, 2,400 gallons of 100 octane fuel. Went back to Indianapolis and picked the crew up, went back to Cuba. And I'd signed the wrong ship for the, for the gasoline in Cleveland. Uh, you sign one and it goes to the Pentagon, you sign the other one and it goes to the, your, your original, your outfit, which was, my outfit was in Cuba. So the, we agreed on the way back to Cuba that I wouldn't, uh, nobody would tell the boss, say anything about it because that was terrible, you know, I wasn't very good. But the, the word got out and about two weeks later, Major O'Neill called me and he said, here, Holcomb, take care of this. And he handed me a bill for 2,400-gallon, 100 octane gas. I didn't have that kind of money. <laughs> oh, it was terrible. And, he said, and I said, I don't have that kind of money. He said, well, what are you doing in Cleveland? So I had to tell him the whole thing. So my punishment was every flying safety meeting we had from then on, well, once a week, I had to give a lecture on how to fly a B-24 on two engines. That was my punishment. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to, got to Italy less than a year later, same thing happened on the same, same side of the airplane. And I knew how to do it. I'd done it once. So I landed to, flew it back from uh, Blackheimer all the way back to Italy and put it on the ground and didn't, didn't hurt anybody. Knock on wood. <laughs> so that's how that happened. I heard B-24s were tricky to, to take off and... They were. And they were. But uh, <clears throat> once you read the book and used it, a lot of people just, they try to horse it around. You didn't, if you had trim, step, trim tabs, and if you used them, you were okay. We learned that early. And the, and the uh, D models, they had a habit when you got going down the runway, the wing tips would come up. But, Davis wing were flexible. They were a wet wing. When the wind, you just, just as you raise off, lots of times you could see the wingtips in on the ground, you couldn't see them. Just as you broke ground, you could see the wingtips. That tended to, to pop a rivet. And then the, uh, in the Bombay, where the electric motors that raise the gear, hydraulic, hydraulic and electric, and everything else was right in there. And, they would blow up before they found that. Now, that's, they found that long before I was flying, and they, they fixed it. But some of the mods, some of the earlier models, like the D models, they, they didn't fix it, didn't, hadn't got it. So that was one of the worst things. But then horsing it around, if you used a trim tab and played it cool instead of jerk it, trying to jerk it, it we, we had no problem. A lot of people. McGovern, he, he didn't like to fly those things. He said it was terrible, horsing it around. Well, I only weighed 130 pounds when I got back from it, and I could fly one just with trim tabs. <coughs> no big problem. Oh, yeah. I, I got about, I ended up with about 1,500 hours in B-24s. You said you had 51 missions? Yeah, 51 missions. I, you're only supposed to fly 50. My last mission was... Uh, milk run right over into Yugoslavia. Well, I got pictures of the, of the airplane <laughs> that I hurt. Uh, my 50th mission was going to be a short one right into Yugoslavia and back. And I got, I was excited and ready to rare to go and I uh, taxied too fast. And I clipped a tip on the engine mount stand and I couldn't, couldn't fly. I got out of the airplane and waved people and they wouldn't stop and let me go get in. So the next day I said, I'm going to do it. The next day we went to Vienna, which you get, you go above the 47th parallel, you credit, get credit for two missions. The next day, the flight surgeon said, you want to go? I said, yeah, I'm going. 
Well, lo and behold, it was Vienna, and they, and they defend that place heavily. And they ended up with 51 missions. <laughs> and they, the guys, they took that wingtip off that airplane and replaced it that day and gave me the wingtip. That was my last one. And they cut a hole in the tip of it, put, put, put a handle in it, and I started to bring it home. To, I was going to bring it home Pride of Orwell. Wasn't it? <laughs> That's what I, they put on there. And they clipped the tip, no 50th trip. <laughs> and I could, I got it to uh, Naples, but as far as I got it, I had to uh, drop it. But uh, <laughs> that's the way that was. <laughs> Funny. Uh, do you remember uh, much at all about your meetings with, uh, with Bud Holly or with uh, Dick Cook while you were over there? Yeah, Frank and I, see, I saw him oh, maybe three times, and, and Frank's, after I told him what I was doing, he said, yeah, that, that's a good idea. I'd like to fly with you, and we'll, we'll send some propaganda back to Orwell. And I said, okay. And then, lo and behold, it wasn't three days later that Frank got blown up over Blackheimer. And we were moving from uh, one air base to our permanent air base on the 31st of May. And I had my airplane already for the move. I had a Bombay racks in so I could, we could move. And I found out that Dick Cook was in uh, Naples. So I told the old man, or asked the old man, ops officer, I said, I've got a friend in uh, Naples and I'd like to stop and see him. I'm taking this crew to, into Naples, dropping them off. They're going to crew rest in the Isle of Capri. And the ops officer said, Hokum, you'll be back here because we're going to make... I said, my Bombay rack's already in. I'll make... Anyway, I make a long story short, I ignored his be back here. I went to see Dick Cook <laughs> in Naples. He was living in a tent. He was in a quartermaster corps, and he just had his appendix taken out, and he was, wasn't feeling too well yet. But we talked, and we talked, and we talked, and talked about an hour, and I finally I said, Dick, can I get some cigarettes and candy? And he says, sure. He was a sergeant, buck sergeant. And he called somebody, and they took me out to the warehouse, <laughs> and they loaded me up with cigarettes, canned peaches, candy, canned fruit, all kinds of goodies, you know, that you couldn't get, even canned meat. So I loaded a Bombay racks. I had them already in there ready to move. And, lo and loaded, <coughs> loaded two Bombay racks full of goodies. Took them back to the base where we were moving from that one to Panella. It was only 20 minutes flying time. And I landed the airplane back at the old base, and uh, the base operations officer met me at the airplane. He says, where have you been? I said, look in the, look in the Bombay. And he said, I don't want to look in the Bombay. And he says, come on, we're going. So the, the colonel, West Point graduate, his office was up on a hill in a tent. And we went up there. <clears throat> this was 1, 31 May, 1944. Went up there, and oh, I walked in, gave him the highball. And he was a West Point graduate. Bonner was his name. And uh, he says, I hear you disobeyed a, a direct order in the line of duty in, in a war torn in a war zone. I said, what? I couldn't figure that one out. And he said, you were told not to spend any time in Naples. I said, yes, sir. Well, I didn't spend He said, did you or didn't you? I said, yes, I did. Yes, sir. Boy, he chewed on me and left me at attention for, oh, 10 minutes or something. And finally, he reached in his in basket. He was, I'm standing like this over here, and his in basket is here. He reaches in the in basket, pulls out a bunch of papers, tears them in two, and throws them in the basket over here. That was my promotion to first lieutenant. <laughs> so that took care of that. And then uh, two weeks later, he got shot down. The colonel, Colonel Bonner, did. He got shot down, and. Uh, the new colonel that came in called me in. I had uh, 750 hours of uh, total time, and I forget how many missions I have. I had quite a few missions. 
and I'd led a group, uh, not a group, but I'd led a box, six airplanes several times, the second lieutenant. He called me and said, what's, what is this, Holcomb? What's, what's the deal here? I said, I don't know. So that was on the seventh day of August when all this happened, came to a head. And I'd been, uh, lost two engines over uh, Germany, landed at B-24 back there with a with the ball turret extended. Everything happened, but we all got out alive. And that was the seventh day of August, 44, that this new colonel wanted to talk to me. And he said, what is all this? And I said, I don't know. So he gave me the, uh, the orders. My, my promotion to first lieutenant dated the seventh day of August, <laughs> the day that this horrible thing happened. And also they dated, I got a distinguished flying cross dated the 7th of August <laughs> for bringing this airplane back with wounded crew of that members. I gave, they shouldn't have given me the distinguished flying cross. They should have given it to that guy who was in the ball turret. <laughs> he, he was more dangerous than I was. But both those orders were dated the 7th of August, and I still have copies of them. <laughs> I mean, that's, a, that's it. That's a long story. Yeah. What what was the, uh, did you ever have a mission where you, you thought it was so bad you wouldn't be coming back? Or were a lot like that? Ploesti was bad. Ploesti was bad. They they defended that both with anti-aircraft and uh, fighters because they need, they want to, Hitler needed the oil bad, real bad. And you could, on the way in, oh, maybe, oh, for 30 minutes before you got to the, Initial point, you could see smoke clear up to 20,000 feet. I, I think I went to our group went eight times, and I think I went f either three or four times, and every time it was just miserable, horrible. And you, they'd pull that, <laughs> pull that, take it back in the briefing room, and they'd say, Plo Esty, and John Jones was, a, was on my left side. He was a good friend of mine, and Buddy Elrod, all American football player from. Mississippi State was on my right side, and the second time they pulled that thing back, <laughs> we, they, we both got sick. <laughs> it was Ploesti, and Vienna was terrible, too. Not not Vienna, not the city, but north of Vienna was Wiener Nudstadt. They had a fighter, they built fighters up there, and they wanted, they defended that very, very heavily. Anytime you got above the 47th parallel from Italy, you were in deep, deep trouble. <laughs> Scared the daylights right out of you. <laughs> how, how soon did your group go in to Ploesti after the original Ploesti raid? That was in August of 43. They went in, that low level, all that, uh, Colonel Kane. We went, our first one was in June of 44, 10 months later. But we went in at alt high altitude. Mm -hmm. It was a mess then, though. Do you recall what the casualty rate was? No, I don't. I should remember that. But uh, now, one of the navigators uh, told me when I got finished, he said, uh, Our group, since the time we left Pocatello, Idaho, to the time that I finished, the 20, 20th of August, we had 105% turnover. Now, don't quote me on that because I, do, I didn't figure that out myself. He's a he was a navigator and quite a mathematician, and he's he's the one that advised me that he he became the uh, squadron navigator, and he had a little, little extra time. And he figured that out. He told me, but I, I wouldn't quote that because I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. One hundred and five percent gives you an idea. If it was even close to that, in that length of time, three months and twenty days, that I was there. See, after I lost my career, I could fly any. They needed, wanted people, so I could fly every day. And I wanted to get out of there. I, I didn't like it, so I went every chance I got. But I went, I, I flew uh, 300 hours of combat, th 300 hours of combat, 51 missions, and three months and 21 days. I went from 160 to 130 pounds of weight. <laughs> but other than that, it was, Nothing happened. I was just lucky. It wasn't my turn. 
That was uh, something else. I got a little clipping here. Uh, Pride of Orwell. This was in the Orwell newsletter years and years ago. You might be interested in that, I don't know. And then I gave a lecture down here at the school when I got back about combat, and they all appreciated that. <laughs> did you uh, did you know Norm Gilmore before the war at all? Yeah, oh yeah. He and my wife went to school together. He ended up a fighter pilot in the Pacific. Norm, I saw him today. And off and on I'd seen him, but I didn't, uh, we weren't very close as far as buddies because he was behind me two years. But I'd known him all his life. And he ended up fly, flying P-47s. Yeah. In the, in the Pacific. Did he tell you what he what he had on his cowling painted? No. Orwell. Oh, Orwell? Yeah. I, be, I didn't know that. He had an outline of the uh, state of Ohio. Uh -huh. And then like an arrow going to northeast Ohio, and then it said Orwell. I'll be darned. <laughs> huh. I just got this brand new B-24G, and like I say, we'd flown three missions. And I didn't go on the 6th of June. And Bert Hayes took it. That was the end of that. It's gone. So I just fly in. Any crew, two or three missions as they come over, and sort of break them in. Uh -huh. Now Frank Holly and I were going to do that. But it didn't, it didn't work out that way. It was, you know, a quirk of fate, whatever, whatever the word is. It wasn't to be. But this book, I'll get, I'll uh, send you the information where you can get if anybody's interested in it. I got a copy of that book and gave it to the Holly brothers, the younger brothers of Frank. And I went over to see him the other day, and he thought he was delighted to death to have that book. And his son uh, is into that book now, the history part of it. They really enjoy it. It's a beautiful book. Do, do you have Gene Holly's phone number? No. Uh, this wasn't Gene. This was... Uh, that would have been Dick. Dick. But Gene was a B-17 navigator. I didn't know that. And he's been doing a lot of research on what happened, to, as he calls Frank Budd, uh, and writing it down. And he was shot down on a six mission during the war, and he's been doing a lot of research on that. Oh. So I'm sure Gene would love to talk to you sometime. Well, I gave his brother. Is that Would that be his brother? You're right. You, Frank's dad is who I talked with, and mother, and told them what I thought had happened. And they were so appreciative that I t took the time to go see him. Well, that was no big deal, because Edith went to school school with him and knew him well and they knew my Edith's granddad and everything. But I told him, I, may, I, may, I probably shouldn't, but I told him, I said, knowing Frank, I bet he got out of that airplane. And it, it wasn't to be. It just didn't. Did he get hit by shrapnels or fighter? Oh, it blew up. The airplane blew up. Uh, flak. Flak. We were fighting. We had fighters too, but I think it was flak that blew it out. I saw the, I saw the airplane going down. And uh, I counted six shoots. And knowing, like to say, knowing Frank, I thought, man, he's gone. But he was a tail gunner, and it was in a flat spin. And a centrig centrifugal force probably so, kept him yeah. in the back, and he couldn't get up. Six of them got out. I, I counted that. And I've got all that written down in my log the, the day that happened and the day every horrible thing happened. That uh, I, I, Brem's Tavern down here in Windsor it used to be a beer joint tavern, and they had a New Year's Eve party, New Year's Eve of '43, and I went to that party. My wife was in having a baby, uh, our oldest daughter in, in Warren, but I went to the party, <laughs> and I won a bottle of champagne, wrapped in a woman's corset as a door prize. So I took the course with me to Italy and hung it in a tent. And after every mission, I'd write the mission on it, where, where we'd been and what happened. I still got that course. Well, that's fantastic. I gave it to George Graham when I come back. Gave, he was the owner. Uh huh. I gave it to him, uh, never thinking I'd see it again. 
then on our 25th wedding anniversary in 1966 or whenever it was, we came from, I was out of the service in uh, back east. Anyway, we came to Oral for, for our 25th wedding. He presented me with that <laughs> corset. So I had the corset. And uh, the 15th Air Force out in Marchfield, they, they would like that corset. And the museum down in Wright Pat would like it. That's one of a kind, and it's right. got, every, got every mission on it that I've heard. So I don't know who to give it to. One of the two of them. Yeah. And if you can't decide, I'm on the library board here, and we're eventually going to add on or build new Are you with, really? with a local history room. Are you? And I've been kind of gathering local history things to put in there eventually. So if you can't decide between the two, it's yours. And that'd be fantastic. Keep it, keep it here local. Every one. That's right. It's yours. Every. And it started here in or, or Windsor, and uh, went all up. I hung it on the, nailed it to the. Uh, tent post and every mission I'd read. And you can still read all the missions. Well, that's a neat piece of history. I'll you've got it. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> then I'll send you the name of that book and who publishes it. You might, somebody might want to get that. Yes, yeah. Because the Holly gentleman that I saw, his son has the book now, and he, he really enjoys it. But it was, there was something sort of cool there when I was talking to him, and I didn't, I couldn't figure it out. None of my business. But. Yeah. And when I sent him the book, it was a gift from Edith and I to him. And he's got the book, and I got a check in the mail, and I, I sent it back to him. I said, "This, this was, uh, it wasn't meant to be that way. We meant it as a gift." And so. <laughs> Anyway, he liked it, and his son likes it, and I guess, I don't know whether he'll share it or not. I don't know. Oh, I'm sure they're, they're nice people. I hope so. <laughs> Do you remember much about uh, base life when you were over in Italy? What did you do to relax? Or? Oh, yeah, it was, we stopped in, uh, <clears throat> we were stationed in Cuba, and on our way to Italy, we stopped in Puerto Rico. <clears throat> We took on 13 cases of Old Crow bourbon. And we went on through South America. No, we didn't drink any of it. Took it all through South America, over to Africa, and up to Italy. We got in our tents in Italy. And there was 13 cases we had. And there was a pilot, a co-pilot. I was a co-pilot then. The, engine, the uh, bombardier and navigator, four of us had owned 13 cases of old crow. On the first mission, after we got there, I couldn't fly because I had too, much, too many hours as a, as a uh, flying B-24. So I didn't fly with the crew, never flew with the crew that I'd been with for over a year. They put the deputy group commander in the right seat to fly co-pilot. And on the first mission, they had a mid-air collision. And the airplane finally got back, but they had a mid-air collision at 20,000 feet, and uh, the, the uh, deputy group commander was a co-pilot, bailed out. The engineer bailed out. The uh, bombardier and co-pilot, bombardier and navigator bailed out. So they left six people in the airplane. And uh, the pilot, Bob Wingfield, finally regained uh, control and flew it back to Corsica and landed it. And I didn't know what had happened. I was flying in, uh, another airplane at the time. And I, I knew that there was something horrible happened. And that night we got back to the back to the tent. And I'm the only one there, everybody else. The four of us slept in the same tent till I could get my crew lined up. Got back on our first mission, nobody there but me. And here's, uh, we had a little uh, Italian boy that, uh, we took on to help us, and he'd buried the, uh, all that booze under the tent pole and put a steel thing over it. And lo and behold, there's, here's 20, uh, 13 cases of booze. So I had inher I inherited, and Wingfield, the guy, one of the four persons that owned it, didn't want it me. So I ended up with all that. So after we'd fly a mission, they'd give you a little shot of 
brandy or something, and you drink that. And I would go to the up on my tent. We'd have a couple more, and you'd go to sleep. And that went on. And lo and behold, when I finished my last mission, we cracked the last bottle of old granddad because I'd give them to people that needed. I didn't. We didn't drink at all. And lo and behold, on my fifty first missions, I had the whole bunch of them come up. Not just uh, the our crew, but half a dozen crews, and we had a little party. We drank the last bottle. So that the last. Jamanzik, the navigator that bailed out, he spoke about seven or eight different languages, and he he sneaked back through the lines. He and the engineer, who was Italian, spoke Italian. But the bombardier ended up in the prison camps, arrested for war. And he always, uh, the bombardier and I would, had known each other for over a year before that. He came to see me in, in Ohio here after he got out of the prison camp. And Edith and I met him in, at the airport in Cleveland. He oh, went inside down and had a cool one. And he says, Bob, you know, I'm not really a, a prayer. Well, he says, I say prayers once in a while. And he said, I, I said something for you. And I said, what did you do? He said, when I was sitting in that prison camp, and these B-24s would fly over and drop a bomb, he said, I prayed I'd see your butt in here tomorrow. <laughs> I said, well, thanks a lot, baby. <laughs> but we had food, uh, pretty good food. Yeah, it wasn't bad. It's canned Spam, but I still like Spam. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so what, what, what were the two bases you were at in Italy? Uh, Cherignola, or uh, Pantanella and Cherignola. They aren't too far apart. What, then, what part of Italy is that? Well, that's ha about halfway between, the, in the southern part, about halfway between Naples and Berry. On a line, you draw a line from Naples to Berry, and you would come off of close to both those bases. Okay. And then the, well, they had a junkyard where you're supposed to take it. If, if the airplanes weren't flyable and you could still get them on the ground, you're supposed to take them to this place. But that one that I landed on the seventh of. August, uh, I, c I couldn't get to the junkyard, and I had to land it in Barrie. And the, the uh, Muskegee Airmen were there at Barrie. They had a squadron there, and the colonel didn't like uh, didn't like it at all because the B-24 landed at that fighter base. In fact, I caught I caught a lot of racket from him. But we only there. I had they, my boss sent a truck that night to pick us up the next morning go back to the base. But he didn't like he didn't like B twenty fours. <laughs> Couldn't help us either that or nothing. Yeah, that was touchy right there, that part. But uh, we went in and I still got oh but I got something else I'll send you. The the parachute see the the three and four engines on a B twenty four. The hydraulic system to let the gear down is a number three engine. And if that's out, you've got to crank the gear down. And uh, it, it was out, and the boys, the engineer, cranked the gear down. But uh, in the meantime, we don't have any brakes. So the guy, I told the guys in the waist, I said, now, take those 50 calibers out of the mouths, hook parachutes on, two on each side, and when I give the word, pop them out, it'll slow us down. So uh, here we go. I got it on the ground in the first, you know, nice part of the steel matting runway. And then we run out of matting and into the dirt, run into dirt still on the runway, and then back on the steel matting, and we're still going about 40 miles an hour. There's no brakes. And then come to find out, before, just right as we touched down, they threw those parachutes on, and it just jerked them right off. <laughs> So we went off the end of that steel matting, uh, going about 30 to 40 mile an hour. And just before we did that, I hit number one and two with full power, and it turned the airplane just enough. So we went sort of skidding off. And then we went down in a great big ditch, and, and the uh, old gunner who had been, well, maybe two feet from, from the earth, and his turret, it was stuck. He couldn't bring it up. 
he'd been shooting, firing a gun and everything, got off the track. But who was about two feet off the ground when we landed, went into the ditch, and here he is about 40 feet up in the air. <laughs> Roy, Royal S. Sailor, I'll never forget him. He got out of there. We got him out of there. Oh, it was a rough time getting him out. Got him out, and boy, he came up and gave me a big kiss on the cheek, and I said, hey, that's enough of that. He said, anytime, anything you say. Face was red. I thought he was going to have a heart attack. But he, he uh, I, I, I rang the bell before we got back uh, when we were over to Zagreb, Yugoslavia, and I said, hey, I rang it three times, twice, and everybody checks in. Everybody but Royal Sailor checked in. And then finally, I said, what's the matter, Ro uh, Royal? And he said, can't get this turret up, ball turret up. And I said, well, you know, the, what's, what's the uh, SOP, standard operating procedure for the ball turret if you can't get it up? Uh, he, re he recited word for word for me. It was, you jettison the ball turret, open the hatch, and bail out. That, that, that's what it says in the book. And he, he read it back, and I said, well, okay. He said, but I don't have a parachute on. So that's why we landed. That's why, if it had been for, for him, we'd all bailed out over Yugoslavia. I wouldn't have ridden that thing back, because it was shot up bad. But but that was, that's the reason we went, flew it all the way back to Italy and got it on the ground. And they gave me a death set. He should have got the death set. <laughs> <laughs> you got him back alive. Oh, yeah. But my, like I say, if it hadn't been for him, I'd have got, got out of that airplane. I wouldn't have tried it. <laughs> But it's worked out fine. <laughs> uh, gosh, I got a promotion in the DFC dated 7 June, 7 August, 44. And he didn't fly anymore. I don't, you know, something like that. You don't have to fly anymore. I'm scared to daylights. And, I, and our colonel, the guy that was chewing me out, he, he had since got shot down. So wasn't any problem. I recommended he don't fly anymore, work on the ground, teach ground gunnery to people who are coming over. And that's what he did. But he didn't have as many missions as I did. See, I was the 7th of August and I finished the 20th. I, I think he flew two more missions with me and that was it. But that new colonel, he understood that, heck, that, you know, you scare a guy to death a couple times, that's enough. <laughs> but that West Point colonel, he was a Stickler for by the book. Couldn't fly an airplane too well, but he he went by the book, and that's why he he and I didn't get to see eye to eye because of, I didn't do anything. I didn't desert facing the enemy. I got some food, <laughs> cigarettes, and candy. <laughs> and by the way, he ate some of the candy. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the and this is a fun another funny thing. The operations officer, Bill Moore, the one that marched me up to see the colonel, he was a captain. And I didn't see him again. I talked with his secretary, <laughs> but I didn't see him. They, must, want, they want you? No, I think that. I think what she was telling me is the Buckeyes just scored. The what? Ohio State just scored is what oh, she was telling me. Oh, good. Oh, all right. <laughs> The, uh, what was I saying? The uh, operations officer. Yeah, uh, Bill Moore. The one that took me up to see the colonel. I didn't see him for years and years and years. And found out when I was in, uh, in 50, 55, I was going to school in Scott Field. And found out he was a brigadier general in the Pentagon. And when I finished Scott, Scott Field, I wanted to go to, uh, to Germany. So I called Bill Moore. Here I am a captain. I called Bill Moore in the Pentagon. To, I left a message with his secretary. I never talked to him. But she called me back the next day and she said, well, how about uh, first in Felbrook, Germany? I said, that's great. I'll take that. She said, consider yourself transferred, finishing school. A couple days later, she called me back. She said, first in Felbrook, southern Germany is filled up. How about Wiesbaden? I said, oh, I accept Wiesbaden, beautiful. So lo and behold, I went to Wiesbaden. We got transferred to Wiesbaden. Everybody wanted to know how a captain could get transferred to Wiesbaden if you weren't a wheel. Anyway, Bill got me 
transferred over there. I never had talked to him. And everything else, and I found out he went to, he, when the POWs come out of Vietnam, into Hawaii, shaking hands with the general, that's, a, that's Bill. He met him. And he was a three-star then, three-star general. And he ended up being a four-star general. And I saw him in Nashville about 25 years ago. Walked in the, to the reunion we have, 464th Bomb Group reunion. And there's Bill, and he didn't know what to say. He's a retired three-star general. I'm a retired major, lieutenant colonel, major. And he says, well, it's been a long time, Bob. I said, yes, sir, it has. He says, you know, things sure do change over 30 years, 35 years. That's all he said. He didn't say, I'm sorry, or I marched your butt up to see the colonel. I didn't say a word to him. We shook hands. <laughs> That's funny. He probably ate some of the peaches, huh? Sure he did. <laughs> but he was bucking for major, and he was a he was a group of, or squadron operations officer. He's bucking, and he made it. Well, hell, he made it all the way to three star to four star general. But at the time, he couldn't fly an air. He couldn't fly a B twenty four with darn compared to. He, he'd get nervous as a cat and over control, and it just wasn't doing it. And I'd already had uh, experience on twin engine in Cleveland here and everything. And it was, as far as I'm concerned, I could fly it with just trim tabs. And he flew with me two or three missions before this had happened. And it was easy to, I didn't have any problem. And he never did fly after, with me after that. Never did see him again. And lo and behold, he went to uh, Vietnam and he became a, uh, yeah, no, he, he shot down a couple of MiGs, but he didn't become an ace. But he, he put two tours in there, flying fighters. And that was more like what he could do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so, that's funny, after all those years. What years were you in Wiesbaden? Wiesbaden, 55. We got there in September of 55, and I went over to Rhine Main in mm -hmm. 56. We were there. For Three, fifty-five, six, and seven. We came back in May of fifty-eight. Yeah. But after I moved from Wiesbaden to Rhine Main, it was like an airline job. It was a special air missions. Yeah. Was the name of the outfit. We flew uh, people from the Pentagon and congressmen and anybody. When they got to Germany, we took over and flew them anywhere they wanted to go, had to go, or wanted to go, like Norway or Saudi Arabia or England or wherever they need to go. And that was a, a real good job. I mean, fine job. Yeah. My dad was serving in the Army over in Wiesbaden and Frankfurt around that time. 55 to 50? Yeah, yeah, 55, 56. Yeah. We were there. Uh, liked it real well. And that's a funny thing. Uh, when we moved to, to Rhine, Maine, Frankfurt, I was flying this outfit, it was just like an airline. You'd pick them up and fly them all over. Aravac people go all over down to Greece, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia, and the whole bit. And lo and behold, they had a kinder lift. They, they, they'd take the little German kids out of Berlin and fly them into the, our zone for six weeks. And we, we took kids, two kids, two different times. Little kids in the, in the dang rehab pad, camp, East Berliners, and take them down and let them stay with us. And I, I wrote a, and I've got a copy of that. I wrote an oral newsletter and uh, told them we needed clothes. And well, the people of old, they sent boxes, boxes of clothes. And I managed to get them flown to Berlin and into this refuge camp, and I got some of the nicest letters. I sent them back to Daisy Dixon and somebody else. Daisy, I forget when she died. Anyway, I kept sending them back, and I still got all those those, uh, that information, thanking us, thanking the people of Ohio for all this stuff. I, I can send that to you if you like it. I've got copies of it. Well, that'd be great. If that's interesting, if that's something of interest. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't want to just... Because no. the people... Uh, and it'll be kept. They, they enjoyed it. They, they, these people were very appreciative. And I think that 12 years before that, we were bombing the heck out of them. Mm -hmm. Mom and Dad said they got to the point where 
they would see the the people like in Frankfurt and stuff go through the garbage. Yeah. So when they had like leftovers, yeah. they would put it in foil nicely and put it on top of the can, yeah. and then they'd see the people come out and get the food, you know. And, That's exactly. And, uh, and he's this little kid, uh, Gerhardt. Oh my, he was a. I bet he. I bet he ended up. We lost track. But he was such a uh, nice young fellow, and he'd been in, born and raised in the east part of Germany, and under strict rules and regulation, we picked him up <laughs> two years in a row. He, he stayed s six weeks with us. Two years in a row. And so the first time he came down, I I, I flew him out back down to to Rhine, Maine, and took him over to our house and everything. And we took him down down to Garmisch on a vacation. And uh, I couldn't figure it out. We, I like sweet corn. And we, we could get it at the commissary, and we had it. Gerhard would do, do everything except eat the sweet corn. And, and uh, the little girl came with it. Finally, I said, what, what's the matter with Gerhard? She says, he says, that's food for the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> he never, but when I was around, he'd eat it. Otherwise, he wouldn't <laughs> But he wouldn't throw it away. He'd give it to her. And she'd eat it. <laughs> food was of a, of a scarcity even then. Now, you, you said you were going right into the jets. I've heard from a, a lot of the guys that first went into the jets, they were pretty risky. You know, a lot of guys trying to learn them just Here, yeah. get Here killed. Here I am, 40, 40 years old. This is in 60, 60. I'm, four, I'm not quite 40, I'm 30 now. And they sent me down to Randolph to learn to fly jets. I, I volunteered. And here's this young fellow, the instructor, had been in flying F-86s over in Korea. He was a young fellow. See, he could just whip that thing off through everything. I mean, really work it over. And yeah, I haven't been upside down since uh, in an airplane for years and years and years. So you go through the, all the cockpit checks and everything, and he's standing right here beside me, and I'm up front. You start off in the front seat. And I went through all everything, and I know that the, the uh, air conditioning control is in the T-33 is right back here. That's part of the thing. It's got to be off for takeoff. This is in the summertime. And I know I turned it off. Everything else checked. So he jumped in the back seat. We got taxi instructions and take off. Canopy down, everything going roaring down the runway. Nope, no propeller. First time I'd ever been in an airplane without a propeller. And he lift the nose off at 85 knots and just let it fly away. And I, 85 knots, I lift the nose off a little bit. And all of a sudden, the cockpit was full of fog. Just, you couldn't see nothing. Couldn't see outside. And so I got on the instruments right just like that. And I just just hopped it right on, all right on out. He didn't say a word. Didn't say a word. And finally I realized, I thought, man, I didn't change, I didn't change that cockpit. And, and I had. But he had sneaked it just to see what I would do. From then on we were buddies because I could beat him flying instruments. He knew it. And he used to like to tear me up on acrobatics, <laughs> so it evened out. Uh huh. <laughs> Young fella, but I could I could whip him on instruments, and he could just tear me apart on acrobatics. Uh, mutual respect. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I finished up. I forget how many hours, and he said, "Well, you can do anything you want to do." And I said, "Well, what do you want to do?" I said, "I'd like to go shoot some GCAs," and he said, "I'd like to meet a buddy over here." South of San Antonio, I said, well, let's go see your buddy. We went up and met him, dogfight, and fought for a while. He could, he could black me out just like that, and he'd still be gone. About four Gs, I could handle anything over four and a half, I'm gone. And he, we didn't have pressure suits there. And he could stand about six or seven when I'm young and just, you know. So that's what we did the last two hours that I flew there. <laughs> He talk, he'd, he'd like to talk to me, and I'd be gone, you know. And he'd say, why? What, what's the matter, old man? <laughs> Where are you? Are you with me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I thought, I nearly, uh, nearly went to F-100 school after I learned to fly jets. 
And I would have gone. Uh, I was number two in headquarters ADC to go. And uh, McNamara, the Wonder Boy, in the, Pen in the Pentagon with President Johnson, he was one of the whiz kids. He said, we don't need any reserve. We're, we're tired. We, we can get along without reserve type. I wasn't regular. We don't need you anymore. And I got a, I got a letter down to channels and saying, you can get up, whatever. And I had two two hitches of the GI, and only one of them was on my record. So they're, he's, they're telling me when I can retire. I whipped out this other discharge paper and one of the personnel, and I said, I'd like to retire. Uh, July, July 5th, 1964. And they looked at me like I was nuts, you know, and finally I said, dally this around and see if it don't work. That would give me 21 years, six months, and four days, which would be paid for 22 years. That's what I got, got paid for. And then, lo and behold, it wasn't two months after that. Uh, things in Vietnam got really hot. And the same, through the same channels. I could stay, I could go to F-100 school. Well, you can stay as long as you want. I shook my head. McNamara, you had a chance. <laughs> hey, uh, that was politics in it. Yes. Finally, they found out that uh, the reservists did more in uh, Korea than the regulars. More of them called back and put on active duty than, than they had regulars. And he should have learned that lesson. Mm -hmm. Vietnam come along. And just politics. <laughs> Uh, you told me earlier, and I missed it on the camera, uh, what did the people in Orwell, Colebrook, and Windsor think when you were buzzing? Did a few people get back and tell you what happened to them? Ed, Ed died. <coughs> Ed died. <coughs> he was driving a milk truck for a prior milk company, halfway out to East Orwell. And I'm coming in from Youngstown, and I hit the 322 at Colebrook. And I just was coming up that little grade, east of East Orwell, there's a little grade there. And I see this milk truck, and I knew it was Ed Dyke. He's, that's his route, you know. So I put the old B-24, well, we were going about 400 miles, the faster we'd go. And I got right down, and I looked in the truck, and, <laughs> and I knew it was Ed Dyke. And I, he, he swore he saw me wave. I don't think he did. <laughs> and by the time... I talked to my wife uh, in, in uh, the next weekend. I was back in Miami from Cuba back. She said, Ed, Ed Dykes after you. <laughs> Just about wrecked the milk truck. <laughs> <laughs> and then several people, oh, that Holcomb guy, he's back in town. I'm glad he's not got the 24s. <laughs> and then this guy that gave me that plaque today, he was quite a bit younger than me. That was Carl Plickert? Yeah. <laughs> who, who did you out knock off a ladder? Spell, uh, Spelly. He had the, uh, the, the beer joint down here at the bottom of the hill going to Windsor, on the right side. Uh huh. He was out there painting it <clears throat> up on a ladder. And I said, one more shot at this. And, and uh, that's after I'd been at Orwell, east to west. And South to north and then north to south, and I walked around. I saw him, and I I went down and looked right in at him too. <laughs> yeah, he always gave me a hard time after that. <laughs> well, you know, young and crazy. <laughs> but that's the way it was. Well, I bored you long enough, I guess. Um, not at all. <laughs> no, I hope not. I've, uh, there's a few more minutes left on the tape. Is there anything else you can think of or oh. want to say? Or? I don't know. Let me see. Uh, something. I told you I, we got back to, to Havana, and my penalty was uh, to lecture on twin engine procedures on a B-24. How to do it. And it paid off for me because uh, less than a year, 7th of August, a year later, I landed one with two out on the same side. And I don't believe there's been too many people that ever did that. 
I'm not sure, but everybody else said, oh, you can't do that. And, well, it happened. <laughs> and, now, you were married before you went in? Yeah. We were married in 41, Edith Cameron. We were married on the 10th of August, 41, and I left January of 42 for the uh, Air Force, right after Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> and then we... Uh, Did you sign up with a bunch of guys? Yeah, 20, uh, 21 of us from Cleveland area. Jefferson, a, a guy from Jefferson, he, he's the only one around here that I knew. And he got killed. We went through flying school together. We graduated at the same time. And then he uh, he got an air, tra air transport command, and he was some, he was flying an airplane somewhere in the states, and he got killed. Uh, that's the only one that I I knew of from this part of the country mm -hmm. that went to. Uh, Air Force at the same time and flew. Uh, Schofield. His, his family still lives in Jefferson. And uh, that's the only one that I knew around here. Of course, we were married, uh, just like I say, August before that. <clears throat> and then we more or less just stayed in the Air Force. After I was out, well, I was out a year. I quit one year after. Uh, World War II, came back here and I was going to go to school and I don't know what happened. I had a GI Bill, I didn't take advantage of it, I should have maybe. We were out one year to the day and then I joined, re-upped as a tech sergeant. I can still fly airplanes as a tech sergeant down in Florida. For a couple of years, like 46 to 48, I, I could fly every weekend. I'd go from a tech sergeant to a first lieutenant reserve fly the airplanes, B-25s. And then they decided to change that. They didn't like to see an enlisted man on a, during a week fly, fly the airplanes on the weekend. Well, they, they, they quit that. But there for about two years, I, I was still flying. And I've got every hour I ever flew from day one to the day I quit on a log. All the missions, every, every mission where I went, all the kinds of, I think it was 16 or 18 different airplanes that I flew. We've got time in each one. Well, I can, I can B-36, I got co-pilot in the B-36 up in Limestone. Uh, no, I don't know. Six, I think it's 16 different airplanes, which is pretty good for country uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, like I say, I went from open cockpit to jet. It's hard to do in one lifetime, but it was it was all worth it. We enjoyed it. Just lucky, you know. Just just luck. It wasn't my turn. <laughs> well, you said you you went through your missions as quick as you could to get them over with. Yeah. Uh, was there any certain way you'd kind of psych yourself up? I had or? a wife, kids. I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to get back and see my wife. And a doctor, oh, Doc, I'll think of it in a minute. He's still alive, and I called him four or five years ago. He remembered me. He's in Chicago. He's blind, but uh, he, he took, uh, after I got up, you know, 100 hours a month, three months in a row, there's quite a bit of combat flying. And about the end of... Uh, Middle of uh, July or before that, I was having a little problem. I was losing weight quite a bit, and uh, I was having a little problem sleeping nights. And, and then the, the next day, I'd try to, believe it or not, I'd, I'd nod off. Well, when I wasn't flying the airplane, I'd have somebody flying it. But I was sitting there, I'd, I'd nod off. That's terrible. And he gave me uh, Doc O'Hara. He gave me, it was, a, it was a, I think it's banned in the state, and it was a drug, a yellow, little yellow pill. And I'd take one of those oh, about halfway through the mission. Man, it would just make everything clear, and it was dope of some kind. I forget mm -hmm. what they call it. The kids, after I heard they were taking it after, right after the war. 
some kind of illegal. Well, it was legal to him because he gave it to me for a different thing. But right. Boy, it made your eyes clear and you could hear and snap to, you know. <laughs> I took about, oh, I'd say three or four of those different times. He watched me real close at the tail end of the, mm -hmm. when I was getting all that time. But he, he understood. He, in fact, he flew with me one time when I had, when I took one of those.